Welcome to the High Value Sales Show of Eversprint.com. I'm Malcolm Louie, the managing member of Eversprint, and today we're speaking with Michael Desrochers, the managing partner of Polite Mail Software, a provider of tools for corporate communications departments and B2B internal marketing. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. Glad to be here. Michael, you grew your company's revenue from six hundred and ten thousand dollars in two thousand fourteen to. 3.6 million in 2017, a 490% increase. And in 2018, you hit around 5.9 million. Before we talk about how you grew your company so fast, can you briefly share what your company does beyond my quick intro and how your company differs from the competition? Uh, sure, yeah. So Polite Mail is providing uh, Outlook email intelligence, uh, not overload. So most of our customers are large organizations with lots of employees and we're uh, extending the functionality of Outlook to kind of add three tools, uh, some list accuracy and targeting tools, some responsive design tools and some uh, email analytics tools to their uh, employee communications. So essentially they can measure and improve uh, how they communicate with their uh, employees. And how would you differ from your competition who might try to offer the same sort of things? Yeah, so our position is, you know, the why leave Outlook just to measure your communication. So, you know, oftentimes customers are trying to use like a, an email marketing tool to do this because you can get some open and, and click tracking through those tools. But then uh, customers have to do list management process and then often that email marketing uh, is getting, you know, filed into spam folders or blocked altogether, uh, or the metrics, you know, just aren't as accurate. So by embedding ourselves uh, into Outlook, we're already part of their existing mail process, and uh, we don't suffer from the, uh, the spam filtering or the blocking, or, and we can, you know, just use their existing exchange distribution groups without them having to go into the list management business. Right. Now, what's the thinking behind using Outlook exclusively as opposed to adding other email platforms like, say, the Google G Suite? Yeah, people ask that. I mean, you know, we might do G Suite eventually. I mean, most of our customers are, you know, the kind of the Fortune 1000, Fortune 2000 level. And the majority of those, 80% or so, uh, already use uh, Microsoft Office and Office 365. So, uh, we just haven't had the the demand uh, for other mail platforms. You know, our opinion is Microsoft's already won the enterprise, and and we're just going to add functionality to it. Now, is there a minimum number of employees where before uh, that you that? Yeah. You so so the way we deploy our services. So unlike majority of SaaS systems that are like a shared multi-tenant environment. Uh, for you know security and performance, we're doing ours on a, a dedicated cloud service basis. We also have you know the on-prem option, which just under 30% of our customers will utilize. So we don't have to process any of their data; they can do it themselves. Um, but generally, you know, to be cost-effective, it's got to be like 2,500 employees and over. Um, one of our projects for this year is to do uh, you know to extract out some functionality and and do a more traditional SaaS to address that smaller market because we get lots of inquiries in the you know thousand employee and up you know thousand two thousand employee type customers we just don't have a good cost effective solution for them at this stage right now you your fee structure is a, a fixed fee or does it vary with Number of users, it, number of employees. Yeah, it vary. It's approximately one to two dollars per employee per year uh, is how it works out. Um, so it's it's really just you know how many people are we keeping track of in terms of the measurement data um, really defines the cost structure. I mean, one to two dollars per year doesn't sound like a huge amount for something no. that can provide a lot more productivity and. And uh, impact, right? I mean, sending an email that goes to spam is a wasted email. Right, exactly. Uh, okay, yeah, it mean, sounds like your solution is really, really affordable. I mean, even if a company has uh, 2,500 employees, you're talking roughly 5,000 a year, right? It's, uh, 
not a huge, not a, not a, not an insurmountable amount to allocate. Right. Yeah. And on that smaller scale, it's a little bit higher because we have that, again, we're doing the dedicated servers, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, once it gets to 5,000, then that scale applies. And right. I imagine it must be a, a relatively easy sell then, right. For people who are doing regular employee communications and are, and are really keen on making sure they're engaged and, and, and improving those communications over time. Right. Yeah. Generally we ask, you know, I think the, the, pain point is, you know, are, are employees even reading the email they send, right? And we can, we can answer that question because we don't just track, you know, opens and clicks. We're actually measuring uh, read time and kind of can show some metrics that show like how much content you're sending out versus how much content people are actually reading. Um, yeah, so for anyone doing communications, it's a, uh, you know, there's some value and having the data to uh, to back up, which is you know usually just you know, intuition based or opinion based. Yeah, on average, what sort of improvement has your customers seen after using, say, a year of polite mail? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we I was just looking at our so every year we do a benchmark survey. So we for customers that participate, we take some anonymized aggregated data by industry and kind of look at what, you know, because when people start using the tool, it's like, what is a good corporate open rate? What is a good, you know, read rate or click rate? So we have that benchmark data to kind of establish, establish that. And I was looking at the 2019, you know, early version this morning, and it's, it's looking like, uh, you know, for customers that have used it for two years, they can get close to a 30% increase in readership. Uh, and if they go to three or four years, it's up closer to, to uh, fifty percent improvement in, in readership. Um, so that's uh, I think those are meaningful meaningful increases. Right. So that's improvement of the readership, not fifty percent of the people are reading it. Correct. Yeah. Fifty. So in other words, wherever they started for a readership metric, mm -hmm. uh, after a year, that's improved by thirty. After two or three years, it's up by you know closer to fifty. Uh, percent so okay uh, do you have any statistics as to you know for the corporate communications you know on an absolute scale what percentage of them are read uh i think it's like 36 percent on uh, average that that's okay. you know that's basically where people start generally yeah okay now do your tools do anything in regards to uh reading retention and comprehension uh we, we do yeah, so we do track the the Fleiss uh, reading uh, scale, um, and uh, we you know in that benchmark we basically can show that the the easier to read you make your communications, the mm -hmm. the higher readership you're going to have. So yeah. um, that's really you know, and and we have some industries, you know, tech industries in particular. Um, we did notice like uh, financials, another one where there, you know there's a lot of uh, acronyms and specific uh, wording that the fly scale ends up putting on the the opposite. So instead of being ten easiest to read, it's one most difficult to read. But in those industries, uh, it's kind of like that the uh, the long tail. So the easiest to read or the most complicated, as scored by Fleisch, turns out right. to be the high, highest readership. Uh, so that's I pretty sure that's just industry terminology specific. Yeah. Then now does your software provide some tools to maybe quiz people on their comprehension and retention? Because there's one thing for people to look at it and read it, but do they remember it an hour later? Yeah, exactly. Um, we have some simple survey and feedback tools. So you can, you know, I don't know how many customers actually do it. We don't automate it in terms of doing follow-up questions, but we certainly provide the capabilities of someone wanted to ask like a, a multi-choice question or a yes, no type question. Um, you can do that. I have seen some customers like, you know, for certain programs, say a change management program, they might do an email where it's like, you know, which of these sentences best describes, you know, our direction or, and they'll have three different versions and then that'll tell you, you know, give you some indication based on how people answer if, you know, is the comprehension there? Are they are they understanding what what you want them to? Right. Now, in terms of drivers for your company, right? You, your your company's growth was um, pretty strong, six hundred ten thousand in two thousand fourteen. 
all the way to 5.9 million in 2018. So over the past four years, it's grown rapidly. What were the three drivers behind that? Uh, I think part of it was just focus and specialization. And, you know, one of the things we did, uh, you know, having a good relationship with some early customers, they gave us feedback in terms of, you know, wish list features. And we, we focused on, on uh, delivering those. And then we really just addressed kind of uh, you know, within our marketing and sales approach, we tried to address uh, what we learned, like the kind of the three major pain points, right? So list accuracy uh, and being able to target certain groups of employees without having to make uh, IT requests and wait for those to be returned uh, was one. The responsive design tools inside of Outlook was another one, you know, as more and more employees access their email on their mobile device, having a, an email message that looks good and responds well and doesn't just shrink down so tiny that you can't read it. Uh, is important, and then the analytics is oh, you know has been historically the primary driver, uh, which is just understanding you know what employees are actually doing with your email and being able to provide you know really you know accurate metrics in that regard. So there's lots of tools, like I said, you know, so a lot of the email marketing tools can provide you some uh, metrics, but like using a email marketing tool, a good open rate might be you know forty percent just because most of that, a lot of that uh, measurement content's getting blocked. And when you try to tell a CEO that their message was only open by 40% of the population, that doesn't tend to go over very well. And then you try to explain why the data is suppressed and all that stuff. So uh, with our tool, you know, on average, we're seeing like a 78, 79% open rate for those corporate communications. So much, much more accurate measure of reach. Yes. And because it's done internally, you might be able to bypass to some degree their uh, antivirus, anti-malware type protection, right? Because yeah, it's, it's really those edge, uh, those, it's not the anti-malware stuff so much, but it's really that email edge protection, right? So spoofing protection and just trying to filter out, uh, you know, it's part of that whole spam filtering yep. process and a lot of marketing email and even at the marketing provider level, you know, get blocked by corporate communications because they just don't want that. that yeah. Stuff well, I, I, I do a bit of a email marketing as well. In fact, that's how you and I initially connected. And, and what I found is that open rates are, are a useless indicator from a cold <laughs> email because the, the, the corporates have these systems in place and they're traversing, you know, all the links, all the pixels and it's showing as open. Right. And I'm, I, you know, I do these campaigns like, oh, cool. The so-and-so opened my email. I'm going to call them and chat with them, see what they think about it. And I call them and they go, no, I didn't open your email. I don't even know who you are. What are you talking about? Right. So I came right. to the realization that, like you mentioned, all these spam protections and these email on the edge filters, they're triggering these things. It gets to a point where I don't even look at open rates anymore because they are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and like a lot of our customers use, you know, Proofpoint and, and Proofpoint has some of those, some of that uh, kind of, link inspection uh, type uh, tools. And so it'll generate a whole bunch of superfluous data if you run it through, you know, if you come in through that direction. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So first driver, focus and specialization. Um, what's the second driver? Um, well, I think that goes, I mean, it, essentially the, our marketing and, and uh, sales approach. So. You know, by having that focus, we know who our customers and who our desired customers are. So we, um, you know, we've just done some consistent uh, long-term marketing programs into those targets. Uh, and then, you know, our, our sales conversations, when we actually get there, just focus on, uh, you know, solutions to their pain points and also the fact that we're not asking them to wholesale change their entire email communication process, right? We're just leveraging their existing process and just adding some tools and functionality to it as opposed to giving them yet another new tool to adopt. Yeah, that makes it easier, right? No one likes changes to their process unless they- Yeah, it's minimal, minimal change is possible, right? Yeah, I mean, you continue using, doing what you're doing and when you're ready, just click the button and improve your communications. Right.
Yeah. Okay. Is there a third driver? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that other than the, you know, potentially, I guess, you know, demand is always uh, helpful. So, you know, we've got some good competition in the market and I think having multiple companies basically trying to address the same issue, you know, we, we all kind of come at it from different directions, but it just raises the profile of, of the, the problem and why you need, you know, an internal specialized tool versus, uh, you know, an email marketing tool. I think just, just, uh, helps everybody. Yeah. Now you mentioned you target the, uh, fortune 1000 companies for the most part. Um, how do you go about finding the, the ideal customers within the fortune 1000? Well, we kind of know what their titles are. Um, and you know, we've, again, some of those long-term marketing programs we've done are with some companies that specialize in edu you know, corporate communications education. Uh, so we've been, you know, partners with them sponsoring conferences and events and stuff for, uh, you know, for more than five years now. So, um, that's really, we just kind of go where they are and we try to do, you know, basically our, our marketing approach is the, the content marketing, you know, education style. We're just, we're trying to provide as much information as we can and, and, to, you know, make our tools as easy as to use as, as possible. And, you know, provide good value and really the best we can do. Okay. So your sales team, are they just uh, inundated with inbound leads from your content yeah, marketing education or are they <laughs> proactively smiling and dialing? Uh, well, so far, I, I wouldn't call it inundated, but so far most of our, our business has come from uh, just incoming uh, leads or so our sales team to date has been uh, inside sales were this year we started with a you know a more what you might call biz dev process where we're targeting uh certain organizations and trying to you know create conversations there um but up till now we haven't uh we haven't done that but uh early indications are that that's that's working so we'll we'll continue expanding in that direction so how many of the fortune 1000 are your customers now uh, I think, well, last time we measured, we, at the end of the year, we had 16% of the Fortune 500. Uh, I haven't calculated it out on the, the Fortune 5000 or so, but, and we've got, there was a list in 2017, there was a list of the, I forget who published it, but there was a list of the 100 largest U.S. employers. Uh, and at the time, 27% of those were, were our customers. So we've got some good, you know, some good, uh, good names and you know those what's nice about a lot of those customers is they also provide you know great feedback and we've got a long list of uh of uh features you know customer requested features that uh has our development teams busy so yeah that's part is always you give your clients what they want or customers what they want and they'll stick with you and and it makes it easier for other customers to find you and get those same features right but I guess the key is to make sure you don't you, you don't uh, add features that no one else wants except that one customer. Yeah, there's always a balance there, but we, you know, so it's, it's just some of them. I mean, a lot of them. Just there, there's some really good ideas, and they're not overly extensive. But it's just mm -hmm. you know, getting to everything. Uh, you know, any kind of development seems to take way longer than you anticipate at the beginning. Yeah, for sure. So you're, uh, the last time you looked, you said you're at, you, you, you help 16% of the Fortune 500. Um, what's your target in terms of expanding your coverage into the Fortune 500? You know, what, what are you aiming to accomplish this year, for example, in, the, in terms of expanding your... your yeah, reach? I mean, if we can, you know, if we can add that. I mean, the thing with those customers, too, is they take a long, it's a long sales cycle, okay. you know, so... It's a good, I think our average, you know, our average sales cycle now is like 209 days. So it, it takes a while to, uh, to reel them in. There's lots of decision makers. There's lots of, you know, security review process stuff that we have to do. So, um, but we're trying to maintain the, you know, the between 20 and 40% growth uh, year over year. And 
and uh, you know, it's like any forecast. It's you know, you have targets and you do your best, but there's no no guarantee. Right now, now, can you share a little bit more details as to why there's a 209 day sales cycle? I mean, it's not a cost issue, right? Because it's not a tremendous amount of money relative to 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 their overall budgets. So, and you mentioned security and, and decision makers, you know, why does it take 209 days? Yeah, you know, if I could answer that in detail, you know, if we, you know, <laughs> it's just, it, it, it involved, because we're embedding into their current systems, mm -hmm. right? There, there's just, uh, there's just the typical, or not typical, but there's just the standard change management, you know, process. So, it's not like, uh, and and also it's it's more or less, uh, you know, generally an enterprise or division wide sale. It's not like a one user, you know, a single user that's interested can download something and just try it. Right? It has to be integrated with their exchange uh, mail environment, uh, which means IT involvement. You know, and that process is just a, a slow boat, and uh, you know, there's lots of as there should be, you know, there's people, they want to make sure that we're doing the security properly and that they understand how everything works. And then generally there's a, a uh, pilot phase to make sure that, you know, what we say and, and what we do are, are the same. Uh, and then we get to, you know, then kind of a go live scenario. So it's, it's just when you're dealing with big ships, they move slowly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, and you are talking about the, uh, Pretty big ships there. Are you able to share who your biggest customers? No worries if not. Yeah, I mean, uh, our number one, you know, our, our kind of our 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 top three, the the number three, I can't say, but um, Microsoft's our our top customer, which is nice, which is great. Um, How many people do they have that you're in, within the firm that you're servicing? Uh, well, number of users. Or a number of employees that are receiving. The oh, yeah. I mean, from. I, yeah, I don't know exactly. I mean, it's somewhere, you know, around 180,000. Um, we also have, uh, you know, um, multiple groups within uh, Deloitte and, uh, and Ernst and & Young. So those are uh, very large, you know, like hundreds, you know, hundreds yeah. of thousands of <laughs> Of employees, yep. Yeah, very nice. Now, is your tool capable of uh, of uh, working in different languages? Because when you're talking about the Microsofts, the Lloyd, Ernst and Young, I mean, they have people all around the world. Yeah, so our tool doesn't. I mean, the, the you know the, the interface is relatively simple, right? It's it's some buttons and English language labels. So we don't really do the translation in terms of the content. You know, that's something you know the customer has control over so they can put the email in whatever language they like. Um, Very cool. Now for 2019, you mentioned earlier, you're looking for to grow your growth 20 to 40% per year. And that's your target. Um, how's 2019 looking so far? The first quarter's uh, behind us now. Are you on track to hit the 20 to 40% range? Yeah, we're slightly under. Um, March was strong, January was weak, and so on balance, we came in a little lower. Part of the reason, too, last year's January was really strong. This year, our December was really strong. So, uh, again, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, we can't force customers into buying. We do, we generally don't play the, the fake price, real price game where we're discounting <laughs> heavily at quarter end or anything. We just, yeah, the price is the price, and um, yeah, we don't, we don't. Yeah, because we're not a public company, we're not forced into that quarterly kind of mindset. Um, yep. We just let the deals happen as they happen. So, um, but you know, we're still up, and you know, things are you know we're seeing strong, uh, strong lead flow, and we've you know through that new biz dev process, even though we've only been at it for three months here, we're seeing some good opportunities there. All right. So to hit your 20% target, or even let's, let's um, aim a little bit higher. Say you want to be up 40% by the end of the year. What needs to be done for that to happen? Uh, well, I, you know, we need to uh, increase our lead flow earlier in the year so that we can let that, uh, you know, that 200 day time span play out. Um, and, uh, and like any fast growth scenario, I mean, we're, we're constantly, 
evaluating and modifying process. You know, obviously the, the, the processes that we had when we were, you know, under a million in sales are significantly different than, than what we have now at, at uh, you know, six aiming for over seven. So uh, we did a whole bunch of work last year to, uh, to modify process and systems. And we think we're in good shape uh, to get us, you know, basically we could double from here without having to make major Major overhauls, but that was, uh, you know, that was, you know, you, you reach those certain stages and you have to kind of reinvest in how you're organized and what processes you use to support the business. Mm -hmm. Now, are you talking about sales processes and systems or? or it's everything that? all the way down, you know, so from, you know, from, from sales to, you know, implementation, you know, ongoing support, development, everything, uh, you know, everything basically needed. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> So is, is your current level of inbound leads sufficient to get you to 40% or, or, or this is where your biz dev team needs to step in and, and uh, juice it up? Yeah. Up? Yeah. So because, you know, with growth, like, you know, so the, so, so the current level of leads will get us basically right around the same new business that we had last year, which obviously would be a lower percentage because we're starting from a higher base. You know, we have a, a pretty strong, uh, you know, 90% of our customers will renew year over year. So we, we maintain, you know, retain a lot of the business and then we add new customers on top of that. Um, but to get that additional growth, we, we really need to get that biz dev process rolling. Right. And, and how are they, how are they going about it for the business development? Are they, um, you know, what's their technique? What's their strategy for generating leads? Uh, it's, I think it's, you know, pretty standard, you know, we have, we have targets, you know, customers like you have these problems, which we solve and here's some, you know, maybe we'll provide a, a case study or, uh, you know, just, uh, some articles that we've written that kind of talk about those you know, problems and how we can solve them, uh, that type of that type of approach. And, you know, so far the opportunities that we have discovered, you know, the, the companies, uh, one of them 60,000 employees, the other one's 140 or 240,000 employees. And, and neither of them knew that, you know, an internal specialized tool existed. Uh, so obviously awareness is, <laughs> is still a thing uh, that we need to need to build. So now, in terms of them making first contact, what techniques are they using? Do you know? Are they cold calling, cold email? Uh, uh, it's a combination. So, yeah, I don't think cold email, like, is ever a great strategy. I, I mean, we're a proponent for trying to have conversations. So, but, you know, no one answers their phone either. So, uh, leaving, you know, voicemail, doing the research on the company to know, you know, who you're talking to and what their pain points might be. And if we have similar customers in the space that we can talk to we'll usually reference those um so that's that's generally our approach is we just you know try that try that outreach um you know drop uh hopefully interesting or educational material to them and then uh you know over time we you know hope to get a conversation going right so you're, you're trying to engage them across different channels phone email uh, snail mail? Do you do snail mail? Uh, we haven't. It's it's that's one of those things. Like we did, we did try, but um, like I actually sent a book. Uh, there was a book on uh, kind of communication measurement in general uh, that I read and liked, and I sent it to ten of my uh, big customers. This was back in 2016, I think, and only one of them actually received it. The rest of them you know, it died in the mail room or whatever. <laughs> Interesting. So I don't even know if mail works anymore. You know, I mean, you know, unsolicited, you know, marketing mails getting blocked, regular mails getting blocked. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. Um, right. Now, uh, what are the typical job titles of the people who are, who are the decision makers when it comes to uh, choosing and selecting and approving your service? Yeah, you know, it varies from company to company. Depends how they're organized. Generally, it's falling 
in the corporate communications uh, bucket. Um, sometimes that's in HR, sometimes it's in marketing, kind of depends on how the company's organized. Uh, usually it's a multi you know, group, like we always, you know, IT or IT security is always involved as a, as a uh, kind of approver, decision maker also. So it's a, uh, it's kind of a multi touch point sale. Mm -hmm. So typically they're more, uh, would you say they're more of the director level sort of folks or VP level sort of folks that you need to engage and contact? Yeah, definitely. Yep. Definitely the, uh, the people that are, are essentially responsible for those programs. I mean, the users are always the people um, that are executing all the communications programs, right? Not necessarily the people in charge of it, but the people in charge of it definitely usually, you know, want the data and can, you know, leverage that reporting data across the organization to support the, the programs that they're running. Right. Now, how are you finding these people to engage? Like in my own experience, in my own uh, business development for my company, as well as, uh, you know, working with our clients, uh, you know, finding the C-suite folks are fairly easy, right? <laughs> you know, they're, they're listed, they're the face of the company. Finding, as you go down the org chart, right, finding the people uh, who are more in the middle, the middle management is more challenging, right? Because their profile is not as high. So how does your team go about finding these people to begin with? Yeah, so that's, you know, you've hit the, the nail on the head in terms of the degree of, of difficulty. Um, so, I mean, you can do, uh, you know, we've doing LinkedIn uh, type, you know, once you understand the company and the organization, um, there are different uh, database, databases out there that you can leverage to try to uh, identify contacts at various organizations. Um, you know, you can, just do general, uh, you know, some, a lot of these people may have other social media accounts besides uh, LinkedIn, you know, they're communications people after all. So um, they're out there spreading the word and, and uh, oftentimes we can find them that way. Right. Now I took a look at your online profile with the tools that I have. Um, I see that you're doing a little bit of pay-per-click, not much, uh, by my tools, you know, under a hundred bucks a month, so not much. Um, SEO, uh, doesn't seem like you're doing a huge amount of investment on that front either. You know, what's your thoughts on pay-per-click and SEO? Yeah, I'm not sure what data you have because I know that what, I know the, um, on our, uh, you know, the, the monthly reports I look like, we're, we're look at, we're spending a, a lot more than a hundred dollars a month, so. Okay. Um, yeah, my tool but, is, is uh, limited to uh, pay-per-click ads on, on Google and Bing. And, yeah, so which is our, yeah, well, we're, we use Google and Bing, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I know. We're, we're, we're <laughs> or maybe you're sending the yeah. ads to a different domain, right? I only looked at your website, maybe your company. Your, uh, yeah, team. yeah, I'd have, I, I'd have to go back through, but yeah, I mean, you know, what we're spending and what we're getting for traffic might be two different things from <laughs> You're right. Yeah, my tools are far from perfect. It just gives me a rough approximation. Right. Yep. So. Okay. So, but is uh, pay per click and SEO a good source of leads, in your opinion? Um, leads people who can, you know. Yeah. So again, traditionally we've been we've been doing uh, more, you know, content marketing. So I guess content sort of falls in that SEO category. Um, we did, you know, once we've figured out our uh, kind of conversion process for the the pay-per-click ads we we did up the budget uh last year um the only downside to that is um you know at least 50 percent of the leads that come in from that source are you know what we call the small business type customers so under those that 2500 employee threshold so um that's why we're looking at you know doing a uh, you know kind of spinning out a a version that could address that, you know, kind of a more of a feature limited, easier to implement type solution, just because we're, we're already, you know, we're paying for those leads and we just have nothing to offer them at this stage. Yeah. What, what's the timing of your, of the light version of polite mail? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I'd like to think we could have, it, you know, my objective was to have it by the summer, but I mean, we have to add a whole bunch of self-service tools that, 
we right. don't have currently. And just like anything development, it just, you know, takes longer than than you you would like or would think it would take. So um, you know, if we can if we can do it this year, it'll it'll be great. Yeah. You ever read the book uh, Mythical Man Year? What's the last part? Mythical? The Mythical Man Year. I think that's the name of the book. Oh, Man Year. Yeah. No, I haven't. No, it's a good book. I read it during my computer science days and it pretty yeah. much talks about, uh, you know, you know, pretty much how, uh, you know, count on I'm doing two versions of your software because the first version is going to suck versus the second one, and, you know, and count on a team of three being much better than a team of 10. Anyway, it just talks about developing yeah, software. Yeah, and that's, yeah, and that's definitely, you know, part of the thing that we noticed is when we expanded the development team, that everything slowed down. I mean, we did add a lot more process uh, that definitely, you know, you, you reduce the uh, potential of, you know, releasing bugs into the wilds, but it does slow things down and, uh, you know, there's cost benefits to everything, but um, I would agree that we were much more efficient with three developers than we are with 14. Yeah. Yeah. Comes with the territory. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, three last questions for you. Um, the first one, if, Polite Mail were to have a billboard on a freeway that's zipping along, what would be your billboard message? And most people only have six seconds before they drive by a billboard. So what's your six second billboard message? Uh, let's see, email isn't going away, so let's get smarter about it. All right, smarter email. There you go. Yeah, we give people a brighter outlook. Smarter email, brighter outlook, which is true if you're using Outlook, so, okay. Yeah. And uh, my two final questions, who are your ideal customers and what's the best way for them to reach you and your team? Yeah, so uh, ideal, like, you know, the, those uh, companies with like 25, 30,000 employees and up, uh, I think they, you know, they've got, you know, the, uh, the community, you know, communicating with a thousand employees is difficult enough when you have 30,000, uh, now it becomes, you know, even more difficult and if you're wasting time on either end either building out the communications programs or sending them out uh, then you know the, the cost in terms of a productivity basis uh, really becomes significant right so if you're wasting five minutes of employees time a week or even a month and you multiply that by 30,000 people now uh, that email that was irrelevant to most is has cost you quite a bit. So um, that's really our our ideal customer: are those large, um, multi-location, often global type customers with lots of employees, and they can, you know, really see a strong ROI from some email optimization. And what's the best way for them to contact you to explore how you can help them? Yeah, so I mean, our website has our our contact info, but the uh, you know phone conversation is always the best. So just uh, you know, it's probably the least used. You know, normally people will ping us in an email, uh, and then we'll we'll try to start a uh, start a conversation. But we actually, if you, if you call us, we answer the phone. All right. Would you like to share your uh, web address, your email address, your phone number? Yeah. So uh, politemail dot com. And uh, the phone number is six zero three six one zero six one one one. All right. And is there a a general sales email they should use if they want to drop you an email? Uh, I think the sales at politemail dot com or info at politemail dot com. Both of those uh, should end up in someone's inbox. All right. Got it. Michael, it's been awesome having you on my show today. I really enjoyed hearing how you grew your company so fast. All right. Thanks, Malcolm. I appreciate your, uh, your time and attention. We've been speaking with Michael Desrochers, the managing partner of Polite Mail Software, about his company's rapid growth. For interviews with other fast-growing, high-value sales companies, or to learn how we can accelerate your firm's high-value sales through automation, visit Eversprint.com. <laughs>